any on Zoom yet? No questions yet. Yeah. Lots of questions, so, um, so okay. So we're in the back. My name's Charlie Vigret. Uh, thanks for being here today, John. Uh, so I wanted to hear a little bit more about, uh, you were talking about a case scenario just then that was really, really interesting. I wanted to hear a little bit more about it, maybe like another case scenario or two. Um, uh, clearly, there, there aren't that many, right? Four per year out of thousands of businesses uh, that have been successful. <coughs> you talked about the, uh, the three engineers who had kind of the sales backgrounds. That was that at Denver, Colorado? Was that a, could you talk a little bit about, about that case scenario and that company and uh, the story there and the talent there? The, Sure. The yeah. So, yeah. So, this is cybersecurity is a just like healthcare. Uh, it's had a very sort of unique uh, industry where there are a lot of snake oil salespeople. I would say, and so you gotta you know separate the wheat from the chaff. These were uh, we we were fortunate enough. Our firm's been doing cybersecurity investments for twenty five or so years. Uh, and so my mentor, uh, one of our lead partners, he really started and developed that practice. So he had a good eye for it. I, you know, found helped find the business, help you know get to a point where we need to make a decision. And he, you know, he was going to be. This is back when I was more in the apprenticeship role of being a vice president uh, versus where I am now. But we, you know, had a chance to invest in it. So why why would they raise capital? Is what you're asking? Is yeah, I, I, the answer there is. It was a multi-billion dollar market. They knew that uh, it was the, the gap that they saw in the market was gonna be exploited, like the void was gonna be filled uh, in you know, the near, not so distant future. And they were right. They need capital to grow, to really like hire the right people they needed to make sure their product was uh, A plus. It continues to be A plus to this day. Uh, they need to build the team around them to scale that business. So they realize, hey, there's a huge market here. Uh, we need to go exploit that market. But I guess that's that's why it made sense for them to raise capital. Uh, they need a lot of help. I mean, they could sell one on one, but how do you build? It's easy, you know, get you in a room and you can go close your business. Like you, every CEO needs to be able to do that. But how do you get the lead? So you're, you know, for me, I'm, you know, on calls five, six times a day. At some points, like. How do we do that? Well, I got to fill up the, the pipeline, right? So, how do we get them a marketer to go do that? How do we get someone to you know sit by them and retell the story? So, get like account executives or sales representatives where they can retell that story. That's why they want uh, outside funding is so they can do it, get to where they need to go much more quickly, um, but also do it very effectively. The company hasn't raised that much capital, so the owners still own a significant chunk of the business. Uh, sorry, the founder still in a significant chunk of the business. So it was dilution friendly. Um, and that sort of pie is much bigger than it would have been had they not uh, taken out, uh, capital from us. And we helped them because we knew the space. We knew how to hire people that would you know, augment the team. Uh, we made some customer introductions. When they got to a point in time where they're like, hey, we need more capital, like things are going really well. They were at, you know, we got them from like one to 15. We introduced them to the next investor who, uh, you know, has helped take them, who's been on the journey from when they were 15 to now 100. So we did a lot of that along the way. And like, you know, a lot can be attributed to us in terms of value beyond capital, but what attracted us to them? I mean, we saw that opportunity and everything. They were just domain experts. They, you know, had the highest uh, security clearances from all the three letter agencies. They were, you know, born and bred hackers. Uh, they had, a, you know, great sort of background. We had reference checks and they had some great customers when we started off. There was, uh, you know, a very large contract from a Fortune 500 company that basically signed up right as we were in deep, you know, discussion on the term sheet and that, uh, contract worked out very well for the business and that really sort of accelerated our decision. John, yes. I, I have a question now. Yeah. You, mentioned, you mentioned that you take several calls a day in a week. Someone asked, what is something that a founder can say or do that will increase the chances that you'll take a meeting? Yeah, I, so it's funny, I, uh, I would say we do a lot of outreach ourselves. Um, so if you're trying to get in front of an investor, I would say whatever warm introduction you can make, it's, uh, <laughs> now that I say it, it's almost, uh, it's, uh, you know, 
it's a double standard almost. We can cold outreach you, but you can't cold outreach us. So I would say <laughs> it, it's uh, that's unfortunate, but I would say that's sort of the industry standard. So uh, the, the I would recommend you know getting a warm introduction from a trusted source. I mean, LinkedIn is the best possible source for that. Uh, but in terms of what you can say, I mean, ask questions on you know. I would say it's more what. what how you can come across. I think growth mindset's the most important thing. Be like, you know, I don't know everything. I know a good amount about this. I know I need uh, help in these areas and just sort of ask where you could get help. And I think that's, uh, that's sort of the most important thing is just showing that you're willing to be coachable and you're going to, you know, want help and, uh, you know, get whatever sort of assistance you can get from that investor. And the follow up to that is, as you know, like you said, it's kind of a supposed to be a two-way street, but that becomes a challenge. How can someone break the startup catch-22 of needing traction to get an investment, but they need an investment to help them gain traction? I wouldn't call that a catch-22, unfortunately. I think you've got to get traction on your own. How are you going to hustle? You got to show them. You know, you got to show the market uh, that you're able to get traction on your own. So, like, where? I guess it all depends on what kind of product it is, I can't comment on that, but if you're, for us with software, okay, if you're an engineer and you can't build code that someone wants to, you know, buy or product someone wants to buy, then you're not a good engineer, you don't have a good, you don't have a good problem, uh, a good enough problem that you're solving. So get it to a point in time using your sort of uh, sweat equity or what, you know, however you want to call it, your own personal time to get it from, to where it's a product where there's product market fit is what I would offer. I mean. In some cases, I mean, there could be capital intensive markets where it's like, hey, I need to go, you know, buy a bunch of product and then, you know, do some of the manufacturing and whatnot. Yeah, I mean, part of being uh, an entrepreneur is uh, how do you do that in the most cost effective uh, manner possible where you're, you know, scraping by, you're hustling, you're doing whatever you need to do to get sort of that prototype to a point where people want to buy it. Um, that would be the other advice I have. And again, like I'm not an expert in terms of that, you know, the conundrum that you're talking about. Um, but I would say, you know, the more you can do with less or nothing and, you know, bootstraps the, the colloquial term for it. Like you just, I would recommend going down that path more than anything and get to a point in time because that, uh, that proves a lot to the market out there, and if you get to a certain scale, uh, the market's going to absolutely love that. And again, you're going. Why would you give up 20% plus of your business when you don't even have a product yet, and you may, you know, need to pivot a few times before it uh, has true product market fit? Thank you. So, Thanks again. Uh, I wanted to ask a little bit. You spoke about cybersecurity. You spoke about healthcare. Um, are there maybe like three other industries that are really, really, really hot? You think right now, um, kind of like, what what are the like top five industries you think that are just like popping off right now? We yeah, we love supply chain. I think Atlanta uh, bodes well for that, just given some of the Fortune 500 supply chain companies that we have here. Um, but I would say supply chain is you know, kind of a potpourri category. So it's workflow automation. How do you, you know, take a task that could take, you know, months or weeks and take it down to out, you know, days or hours. But how do you sort of verticalize that for a specific solution that's that's bigger? So, I mean, I would say on the supply chain side, two of our most recent deals that we absolutely love, um, one that closed in uh, last July, my partner Elizabeth Stevens closed, uh, is called Supply Pipe. They are helping uh, suppliers into Walmart and now Kroger. Uh, so this would be, you know, the 50,000 to 80,000 suppliers call it, you know, they have, you know, called Butterball Chicken, King's Hawaiian uh, bread rolls, you know, anything that lines the shelves of Walmart. When they go and they sell their product on the shelves of Walmart, Walmart has about a hundred different instances where they can find that company or not give them like cash back if they don't deliver their goods on time or in full. And that's sort of the basic piece of it is, hey, did you, we said we were gonna give you like 80, you know, loaves of Hawaiian bread, right? But you gave us 60. Well, the whole, you know, Kings Hawaiian can say, hey, I actually gave you 80. Here's my audit trail for this. This gives them the audit trail. And so it's a two-way street where it can say, hey, 
uh, Walmart's happy because they now have like this actual like digital audit trail. It makes their lives easier and then it makes their customer lives easier because that's money that can go straight to the bottom line. That's a $6 billion market across um, Walmart and across Kroger where they are right now. They're moving to some other ecosystems as well. Uh, but we see that as, as a really cool sort of niche software with a pretty big market. But so I'd say like, how do you make, that's a workflow automation supply chain curve problem like how do you do something that's tedious and you know just takes a lot of time and makes my life painful because I you know I've got cash flow problems already as a as a supply chain company or sorry as a supplier in a Walmart how do I get that cash back and I'm able to invest it in other things so that's one another one we have uh, the one that should be closing here shortly and that one's based in in Arkansas that one's like out right outside in Fayetteville Arkansas like right outside Benville where Walmart's located so just another smaller market where you can build great companies everywhere you know they're at almost 15 million in revenue so we're very excited about that one another one we're about to close about 12 million in revenue it's uh located outside of washington dc and it is scraping data from every grocer uh so walmart uh target those are the big ones but then also you know Publix, everywhere else and it's selling that data uh back to uh the grocers and the 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 consumer packaged goods companies, the CPGs, you know, call it the Nestle's, the Hershey's of the world. And it basically tells them pricing by item, by location. So they have a heat map where they can go and show you, uh, hey, for this particular type of milk, call it like Horizon, you know, 2% milk that's 32 ounces versus 64 ounces. How is that trending across the entire country or across my entire footprint? So I can see you know, in Atlanta, in certain areas, you go to like, you know, Northwest Atlanta and it's $5. You go to Southwest Atlanta or Southeast Atlanta and it's, you, you know, 460. What's driving the difference there? And you can kind of see that heat map across places. And so this really helps them handle their pricing, uh, which is paramount in this inflationary world. So we see that as, you know, what is a critical issue for these, uh, for these retailers? And it's knowing, they not only don't know that they're, where the pricing is, because they have people go in, kind of buy the shelves, and they're just, pricing's not necessarily there. Uh, this gives them the ability to access that data, not only for themselves, but for their competitors to drive their pricing decisions. They can do that. Um, and then CPGs can do the exact same thing and influence price changes as well. So we see that, you know, pricing in an inflationary environment is very exciting to us. And we think, uh, you know, th even if inflation comes down, People now know about this as a secular sort of interest for them versus, uh, you know, just an ephemeral cyclical one. Jake? Okay. Just looking here on Zoom. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, so you briefly spoke on how healthcare and, excuse me, sorry. I'm kind of passionate about it, healthcare. But you've spoken on how the inefficiencies and bottlenecks of healthcare are. And MP's main focus, one of them at least. Yeah. Um, so, being a vice president and having some tenure, what are some innovative processes, value propositions, products that you've seen within the healthcare industry that you think are kind of on the frontier of solving these big issues? I think a big one is uh, called social determinants of health. Uh, so, really, it's who are the most at risk population and they usually drive the highest cost to our system so they could be Medicare or Medicaid patients where they have you know dozens sometimes of comorbidities so they could have you know obesity diabetes uh, you know heart conditions liver conditions like they're mobile in their house uh, what what it, those are they're going to drive significant costs but they're also the ones that need the most care and they need uh, sometimes they're the most helpless and so how do you get a way to help them out where you can do it in the most, honestly the most cost effective manner for the healthcare system, but also where it benefits them where they're not left behind. And there, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of focus going into that right now. And so we have a couple of different avenues for it. We have a, uh, a company in Austin that's you know, effectively a marketplace where, you, I mean, you can go on as a user right now. It's you know, B2B to C, but it also helps out employers and it helps out uh, those in state you know, Medicare, Medicaid systems. 
uh, where you can go on and say, hey, I need to find help. It's called findhelp.org. You can go in and say, hey, I need uh, to figure out, based on my insurance, where am I covered to just go to my primary care physician? Where's the closest and like sort of best cost urgent care for me? Where, uh, you know, where can I go if you're in certain populations? Where can I go get food right now? That's the other thing. It's like, how do I go to like a, a you know, a food pantry or somewhere so I can go, you know, feed my kids? That's that's one sort of way that we've gone and solved. And they're again selling to state populations. Uh, sorry, selling to state uh, Medicare, Medicaid programs are also selling to employers too to help people guide uh, em employees to the right uh, coverage areas. And it has like ratings and everything. So you're like, hey, I want to see this physician versus that physician. That's one area. The other one, we have another company that is basically doing the turnkey help to that person with, you know, a lot of comorbidities and going to their house, getting them food, getting them, uh, driving them to their doctor's appointments, bringing a doctor into their home, uh, getting them like the right uh, equipment that they need to their house so they can go do what they need to do that would service them, you know, appropriately for their health conditions. That's a huge piece. So they're the, you know, the 0.1 of the 1%, 0.1% of the 1% of, uh, you know, those most afflicted in the healthcare system. What was the name of that turnkey solution? That's called Upward Health. Upward Health. Okay. Yeah. And so social, the broader concept, social determinants of health. I've got a couple of questions yeah. for you, sir. We have a chefpreneur who is trying to build and scale a mobile barbecue and catering concept. A main street company like the ones we typically, we frequently see here at Georgia State. Are there any funding, suggest, investment type funding suggestions for non-tech businesses or food entrepreneurs? I think those are ones where I would recommend the sort of bootstrapping path. Like go, you know, you got, you got to be your own sort of turnkey marketer. It's going to be a one person show, right? I mean, you're going to want, you're going to want to not only make the best barbecue uh, wherever you're driving to, if it's a mobile food truck, you can drive wherever you want. I mean, go to like, you know, Boise, Idaho, where my countries are, where there's no companies are, where there's no good barbecue, or you can go, you know, somewhere in pockets of Atlanta where, uh, you know, there's not good barbecue, but regardless, you're going to have to figure out, you know, how to have a good product, you're going to want to figure out um, how to market yourself. And so I think this is a great opportunity for you to learn all those softer skills outside of making great barbecue, where how do you, you know, market, how do you do sales, how do you do finances so you can, you know, go sell, get cash for some of your, uh, you know, initial uh, baking, you know, initial barbecue, uh, the days that you go and sell it, like the money that you get back of that, where are you going to reinvest it? So I actually think from a bootstrapping perspective, that's, that seems to me uh, an easier one. And then it's, it's once you get to a certain scale with that, I think there's a concept that you can do where branding really comes in. Uh, and it's sort of like, what's your unique take on barbecue? Is it you? Is it uh, a certain dish? Uh, that's where I, you know, I'm again, I'm not a food, a foodpreneur, I, uh, but I would say that's where branding really comes in on the consumer side is that, you know, how you differentiate. Do you have a certain sauce that you could sell on e-commerce? But it's getting to that sort of, you know, that uh, uh, fame where you want to, you can exploit it and then uh, capitalize on it. But that, you know, <laughs> the zero to one there, I, I don't have great answers for, but I would say if anything on that front, I mean, that does not require much capital to get off the ground, um, I would think. Uh, if you want to like buy like a food truck to the nines, it probably does, but uh, how do you crawl, walk, run in order to get to the scale where you can buy a food truck? Thank you. Um, and you mentioned kind of getting started. Another, someone else asked, do you need a valuation to begin the conversation? Is a valuation, is that the price, is that a ticket to starting a conversation, does someone have to have a valuation for their business? You should have that uh, for yourself. Um, you should get some, you know, ask you know people that are trusted that you wouldn't necessarily say are invested in you, and, and have you know some some grounding, some data behind that, the data drivenness that I was talking about. But the biggest uh, mistake I see uh, CEOs make is going in and 
having a slide in their deck saying, hey, we're raising, you know, $5 million and we're valued at $50 million. It's like, we're, you know, our job is to determine, you know, what your price is. And yeah, we may be way off. There may be someone that, you know, pays you more. There may be someone that pays you less. But I would say that's, that's sort of the, the market's job to determine. So, you know, for friends, for like an angel investment, maybe you can go and raise it at a certain level, but you are going to want to negotiate with sort of that lead investor that's like, hey, I'm raising $100,000, someone's going to put in 50 of it. Uh, so like, you know, half of the round, maybe they can determine, work with them, and that you have sort of an anchor investor that can come in. That would be the one time where you discuss it, but I'd really, I would encourage you uh, and urge you not to just say, hey, here's where I'm, here's, here's the valuation of my company, take it or leave it. It's not Shark Tank. Can you talk a little bit about, so, um, uh, there, you know, just because you pitch to one investor and don't get an investment, that's probably not a reason to forego seeking outside capital, but what if you pitch to 10, 20 <laughs> investors, you know, you're getting the warm introductions, you're getting in the door, you're pitching, but you're not raising. What's, what's going on? Yeah. You know, in that case, I mean, it's sort of what feedback are you getting? Are you getting some consistent reasons why and i'd always ask when you get to know it's got you gotta get a why and then if it's hey you're not the right fit for us i think that's a cop out for us like if someone just says hey uh if someone comes and tries to raise money from us and they're too small and we're just like hey you're you know not a fit you're too small what they should ask next that's the easy answer what they should ask next is like what do you recommend for me like if you could really poke holes in this what could you recommend so you want to get that consistent feedback on, and when someone tells you no, you want to get sort of more reasons why. Um, and you know, they, you want them to call your baby ugly and tell you why, you know, the, the flaws in your baby, right? And so I mean, you can fix them, you can fix a company. So what are those? Are those consistent, uh, consistent sort of traits of your business and are they fixable? And if it's something, something that may not be fixable or requires a lot of money to fix, maybe the market has spoken to an extent and that's where I think that's where the advantage of like not raising capital because once you raise capital uh, and you're then told like maybe this company's not gonna work out that's a much tougher conversation because you're just you're beholden to other individuals out there other investors and that's that's tougher but in that case it's like hey should I pivot the business should I like go and pursue another idea that I have because you know 20 investors have told me the same thing that this is gonna be a slog and maybe I'm in a saturated market, or hey, maybe I just need to do X, Y, and Z, and uh, I don't need to raise capital, and this is a small market, it just doesn't require outside funding, because I guess, the and I think that's an important thing here, is not all companies need to raise capital, particularly if you're doing, uh, you know, if you're trying to go a certain route, and honestly, own all of your company, and, you know, really be your own boss, and not, you know, <laughs> not have to deal with calls from investors all the time. We're not micromanagers. Like I think, uh, you know, we're a company's been around, firms been around 40 years, people like working with us. But when, th you know, if you want to just sort of call your own shots, do it sort of your own way and that works your out, that sort of fits you more, then I wouldn't raise outside capital. And there's certain businesses, most businesses shouldn't raise capital. And so you can sort of see this sort of fork in the road and say, Hey, maybe I sh if I really want to go down a sort of an invested, uh, you know, investor-driven route, uh, maybe I need to change my business model. Maybe I need to pivot the business. Maybe I just need to shut it down and go focus on other things, uh, or join a company or learn more uh, a about the specific space and come back uh, and revisit this in three years or something. That's one route. The other route is maybe this is just a smaller market, and why would I go dilute myself? I can control my own destiny. I can go get this to a certain size by bootstrapping and generate cash and uh, you know go make a great living doing this like that i think that's another route that can go down and uh there are a lot of businesses like that out there i mean there are you know i have a friend who's a private equity investor in in franchisee businesses and he was saying you know one of the one of the domino's pizza franchises they were trying to to buy was this you know doc guy who's a doctor in louisville kentucky own like a huge footprint kind of in rural or suburban Louisville, Kentucky. The guy dropped out of being a doctor after two years and just realized he could make, you know, $750,000 a year by owning multiple Domino's pizza franchises. Like that's, you know, you can make a good living by doing certain things and maybe that's not like the most exciting exit or what have you, but 
if you get excited about doing that and, and building a great pizza franchise or you know whatever it else might be, apply it to whatever you want to do, that's a very exciting living. And maybe that might not be investable, but that's that's a very good living. Uh, I think that's a very good way to go run a business and that person reports to their self, so. Okay. Um, so last week we had another member of our ecosystem, Nikia Malacio, come and talk about how do I fund my business? And he talked about some traditional as well as bootstrapping. Obviously on the traditional financing route, you have programs like the 7A program, uh, the 501 program for that provide resources to help mitigate some challenges that would typically get someone to know on that side of the house. Is there, are there any special programs with investors or with NMP for woman-owned companies or underserved markets? Yeah, I would, I mean, it's a critical thing that we're always looking at. I mean, we are, yeah, I mean, we're, if, if you have a, I guess it really comes down to, do you fit the criteria of investment that we have? So uh, I would say that is very much something that we're looking for. And, uh, you know, I mentioned the company Red Canary was uh, the, second business that I sourced, the first business that I sourced in 2015 was a business that was, you know, black female CEO. She was awesome. We invested a great outcome for us. I mean, that's one where we're sort of like this all fit. And I, you know, talked to her a little bit about it, but there just aren't many, I guess, in software, in the spaces that we're in, we're trying to do whatever we can to get find more CEOs that sort of fit the mold of the criteria we are because it's oh, it's a two way street for us. That would be awesome to go and find businesses like that, and we're trying to do things kind of at the earlier stage outside of funding to you know bring more CEOs, bring more companies that have leaders that fit that mold uh, to you know the, get to the stage that we are. But the other side of it is like we can invest in companies that are outside of our scope. So it is sort of this fine balance. And we're trying to figure out ways, honestly, to to fit that. But I would say, you know, if you are doing that, and like if you're in software, if you're in healthcare, and you're, you know, you're in that category, I mean, I think our firm, we'd love to talk to you. I'd love to talk to you. Everyone in my firm would love to talk to you and figure out how you get from, you know, an idea, you know, some initial traction well below the stage that we're at to a point where you're a Norm Mosley candidate. I mean, I think that's that's what we're trying to do the most of. But in terms of, yeah, I mean, that, that's that's the big thing is like we're we're trying to figure out ways to help companies get to fit our criteria. And then, yeah, that would be a slam dunk for us to do. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Art. And thank you so much, John and Jennifer. This has been amazing, super insightful. I have a two-part question. Yeah. Um, so you shared a couple of your favorite success stories um, as far as investments that you've done at NMP. Is there something that sticks, or a specific company, excuse me, that sticks out when it comes to the biggest investment that you guys have made? Um, that's the first question. And secondly, is there kind of like a pink unicorn company that you haven't seen yet, but you guys are actively looking for? So I guess first part of the question is like, what 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 drove? I mean, that Red Canary company is a great company. That's one, you know, the, the Denver one, uh, cybersecurity one. I mean, I think that answers the first. Hopefully, that answers the first question. Is there something additional behind? I need to want to elaborate on there. As far as how much was invested into? Oh yeah, I mean, it was that was a big one. So we, you know, invested a significant portion of our. Uh, we invested. That's the biggest investment that our firm's ever made. I mean, bar none. And then we've got confidential. Uh, I can't. I can't disclose right. numbers, but that's the biggest investment that we've made. Um, you know, I had to go talk to our limited partners, our investors, in our fund to go put more money into it. They're very supportive. Uh, we have a couple other healthcare ones. Again, they're more capital intensive, so they're you know provide. They're they're more cap. They they require more capital to get off the ground. Like that company Upward Health that I mentioned. That's not quite there, but that requires a lot of capital to get to the next level. There's a pharmaceutical like a pharmaceutical services company that requires a lot of capital so those are ones that just require more capital and so those are going to be bigger bets but we feel very good about what will happen long term in all those businesses 
Uh, so I guess that answers the first question. The second one is what you know. What's next? What would be the next large investment to make, or what? Uh, I want to make sure I'm answering it correctly. I guess to be specific, is there a company that you haven't necessarily seen, or a solution that you haven't necessarily seen, but you are actively looking for that is falling under your scope of investment? That's a, no, that's a really good question. I mean, I would say there's some firms that are thematic investors where they're like, the big thing right now, chat GPT, open AI. I mean, <laughs> I could be proven wrong, but I think we're kind of like in the, the, the peak of the hype cycle there. There are a lot of, we call them like features versus products that are getting invested, at least from our opinion, where, you know, this is a nice to have versus a need to have, and there's just a lot of funding going into that right now. We're constantly monitoring that. We're trying to use, you know, open AI and AI in general and, uh, you know, use it in our products to, you know, augment them. That's something that we're constantly trying to do. And if a company says, hey, we've got, you know, open AI already in our product and here's how it augments it, but this is not built on open AI. Like there's blockchain was one four or five years ago. There's like, hey, we use blockchain to facilitate X, Y, and Z. And the question would be, why, why would you use blockchain? Why wouldn't you just use like the normal protocols out there and just have like a typical audit trail? So anyways, it was just a, it's like, is this a buzzword or is this um, actually applicable and adding value to this business? That's, so I'd say like AI is a big one right now, but I would say, you know, generally there are some investors, just back to what I said, thematic investors, they're like, hey, we're an, a, we're an AI focused fund. We wanna just go, make 10 bets in AI, and that's, this is gonna work out really well for us. Um, that's not what we do generally. We are healthcare and software investors. Like, we're gonna search for cybersecurity companies. We're gonna search for supply chain companies. We're gonna search for social determinants of health companies. But we really know that we're a little bit in Ivor Tower as investors, so the CEOs and the founders of those businesses are gonna know best. They're in it day in, day out. We're you know a board member. Uh, they're gonna know the business inside and out. We want them to tell us why this is such an appealing opportunity and such an appealing market. So if, you know, thematically you check the box of cybersecurity is huge, healthcare is huge, um, then why is your opportunity for your specific company so huge? That's what we want to hear from you. And that, you know, back to what you can do to wow an investor. I mean, that's, that's a huge thing. It's like, why is this such a compelling opportunity? What are the you know, micro and macro tailwinds. Micro being like, what are you doing in your company that like, you know, what are the catalyzing events that make you, or are having you grow so quickly? And then, you know, almost as important, what are the macro tailwinds? You know, I mentioned inflation driving this one company. That's a great one. We don't think that's, uh, you know, this is open the eyes, this is a secular trend. Uh, we're in like the, you know, they call it, to use a baseball analogy, the early innings of this trend. Like we're, you know, top of the first inning, this is gonna go places 10, 20 years from now, like we love hearing all that as investors. And I would say Normosi particularly, we want the CEOs telling us that. We have sort of our checklist of themes, uh, you know, the unicorn themes, but in terms of what those specific, you know, silver bullet or, you know, uh, ways to exploit them, that's where the CEOs come involved. So we're, we're out of time, so maybe we'll just end with what we, we, we've, uh, I think provided a lot of advice throughout the discussion, but um, maybe let's just end with a couple of pieces of pieces of advice that you would offer uh, aspiring entrepreneurs or new entrepreneurs. People is the most important, or, or are the most important things. Uh, grammar is too, I guess. But uh, <laughs> no, I would say people. Uh, when I was in, uh, when I was doing a master's in finance, uh, I scoffed at the organizational behavior class I had. I was like, oh, I just want to, just want to learn, you know, finance, how to value companies, go to like talks like this. Uh, I, what I didn't realize was the interpersonal dynamic uh, and how you basically get on the same page with someone and align with someone is one of the most important things. And like in, in our job, you know, there's a lot of that internal. So like in our firm, like, you know, you can at your company as an investor, you can, uh, or Nora Mosley, like, I'm poultry aligned with everyone. There, I, you know, I know how to navigate. There's not really politics for a small firm, but like I know how to navigate every individual personality. But the most important thing uh, is probably helping navigate the CEOs that you're working with, and like what what buttons to press, what levers to pull, if you will, and uh, how you, you know, 
have them see your side of the story, but also how you listen to their side of the story and you find alignment in the path forward. I think that's the most, probably the most important thing. And if you're going to be a leader, which I think everyone wants to do who's on this call, uh, it's how you do that with, uh, honestly, it's gonna be the people that you're employing, right? And like, I think that's, you know, seeing leaders do that, and having people like, you know, really do anything for them and just really be beloved by that certain leader. I mean, that's, that's a special quality and trait, and that's something that I think uh, it takes a lot, and that's a very important piece that, like, you can't, you're gonna have to learn on the fly, uh, but I think that's probably the most important thing because the rest of the stuff you can kind of learn, and it takes time. I mean, you can, but you can learn, you know, the data-driven pieces. You can, you know, learn to code and build a great product, but how you build all that and, and build it at scale, that's what takes people, you know, to the massive scale of companies where you could be the next, you know, billion dollar business. Well, let's give John a hand.